This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. On December 7th, 1941, Japanese forces conducted a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, killing approximately 2,500 people and injuring another 1,000. Then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated that it is a day that will live in infamy. On January 22, 1973, the Supreme Court of the United States legalized the killing of innocent human babies by the process of abortion. And friends, since that time, nearly 60 million precious children have been put to death in some of the most inhumane ways imaginable. It is one of the most shameful dates in American history, and it is a day that will live in infamy. But friends, absolutely we must add to this list Friday, June the 28th, 2015, as a day that will live in infamy, because on that date, the Supreme Court of the United States made it legal for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. And in a five to four vote, they in essence forced it upon every state in the country. The names of those who voted for this should be mentioned. Anthony Kennedy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan. Friends, I want you to remember those names because they are responsible. They took God's Word and the Constitution of the United States and they threw them in the trash can. I know a lot of patriotic Americans have been feeling less patriotic recently because they have seen the leadership of this country trample the values that traditionally we have held so dear. As a veteran of the United States Air Force, I have always deeply appreciated the sacrifices of soldiers from years gone by as they have fought for this one nation under God. But friends, I've got to tell you, lately I've been feeling a lot like Lot. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and then it speaks about Lot. And in verse 8 it says this, "...that righteous man dwelling among them..." tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. The King James Version says that his soul was vexed daily. Have you felt that way recently? I know I felt that way when I saw the White House of the United States lit up like a rainbow after the Supreme Court decision. And on the heels of the Supreme Court decision, Nancy Pelosi stated that this is, quote, a declaration of our deepest held values. Another congresswoman, Linda Sanchez, simply stated, love wins. Friends, as disturbing as those statements are to me, what has disturbed me perhaps even more are the things that I have seen since that time. There has been a flood of comments on the internet and in social media about this decision. Now what I want to do for the next several minutes is to address some of the things that are being said, but I want to look at them from a biblical perspective. Nine things that we want to cover in the next several minutes. Number one, homosexuals have a right to be married. That's one of the things that, are, that people are saying, they have a right to be married. But friends, there's a very serious problem with this, and that is they are not married. You see, they were not married on June 27, 2015, and they were not married on June the 28th, 2015. You see, the Supreme Court does not have the right to decide this. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6 says, Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Friends, this verse tells us something very important about marriage. It tells us that God is the one who does the joining. And so if God doesn't join them, then they are not married. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court or anyone else says. And the fact of the matter is, God will not join together two people except in accordance with His laws. And so in reality, what has been done is God-fearing government officials 
have now been put into a very tough spot because now the law of the land contradicts the law of God. And you see these government officials may be subject to, to penalties if they refuse to perform or assist such weddings. They may be fired or, or perhaps even worse. But you know, none of this changes the fact that homosexuals are still not married. All right? Number two, people are saying all sins are the same. That one sin is no worse than another sin. Friends, I have heard this a lot lately. First, I'm not sure where this idea comes from. You know, there's no verse in the Bible that says this. Now, it is certainly true that any sin can cause a man to be lost. It is true that any sin is a violation of the law of God. That, that is certainly a fact. But friends, it is simply not the case that all sins are equal and that all sins are viewed the same in the eyes of God. Now, I want to begin and I want to show you a statement made by Jesus Himself. In John chapter 19 and verse 11, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And of course, Pilate is conducting this trial with him, but I want you to listen to what Jesus says to Pilate. He says in John 19, 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who has delivered me to you, now listen to what Jesus says, has the greater sin. Now, I want you to notice particularly that Jesus refers to one sin as being greater than another sin. Now, we could stop right there and this matter would be settled, but, but let's keep going here. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now friends, if all sins are completely equal, if there is a, a level that you can reach and all sins are equivalent, how could a person grow worse? Wouldn't he just remain at that same level? Consider this. Here's a third passage. Psalm 19, the Bible discusses secret versus presumptuous sins. Now, a secret sin is a sin of ignorance. A presumptuous sin is a sin that a person commits with full knowledge. But listen to this. Psalm 19 and verse 13 refers to the presumptuous sin as the great transgression. That is, if I sin against God and I know that I did it, I in essence am shaking my fist in His face and saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. And the Lord said, this is more serious in my sight. What's the point? It is worse than the secret sin. Here's another passage, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. The Bible says, These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. Now friends, what's the point of this passage? If all sins are viewed equally by God, what is the point? You see, the point is God views sins differently. Here are some sins that are particularly offensive to the Lord. Another passage, Exodus 32 and verse 30, when Moses came down from the mountain after visiting with God, receiving the Ten Commandments, he came down and he found Israel worshiping a golden calf and he says that they had sinned a great sin. In fact, in Exodus 32, 21, Moses asked Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? 1 Samuel chapter 2, 22 through 24, the Bible discusses a sin against man versus a sin against God. Two different types of sins, one more serious than the other. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible talks about the fact that there is a sin unto death and there is a sin not unto death. Now, it's not our objective right now to talk about what those are, but simply to observe that sins are not all the same. There are different types of sins, different categories of sins. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible tells us about a Christian who returns to the world after having obeyed the gospel, that the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So why is it that God would punish one sin more severely than another? Why is the latter end worse than the beginning if all sins are the same? 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith, now listen, and is worse and is worse than an unbeliever. Friends, we could go on and on and on. The Bible is filled with passages that teach that all sins are not the same. Some sins are greater. Some sins have greater consequences. 
You know, who would believe that God will look down from heaven at a man who is sexually abusing a child and view that the same as, say, a person running a red light? You know, that, that's ridiculous. You know, the Bible teaches that to abuse the innocent or to abuse children or, or widows, that particularly aggravates the wrath of God. Not all sins are the same. But here's number three. Here's a third thing that people are saying, and, and it kind of is linked to the previous one. People are saying that homosexuality is no worse than adultery. Homosexuality is no worse or, or no different than heterosexual fornication. I have frequently heard people making this argument since the Supreme Court ruling. People are saying, I don't know why you're getting so upset. They say that this is no different from adultery. God views all of these sex sins the same. Friends, again, this is not true. Now, if we open our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 26, I want us to observe what the Bible says there. Let's read it together. Romans 1 and verse 26. The Bible says, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. Now notice he's talking about homosexuality. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due." Now, there are some key phrases that I want you to notice from this reading. First, I want you to notice the words, vile passions. God gave them up to vile passions. One version says vile affections. Let me read you the definition of the word vile. Vile means morally base or evil, wicked, depraved, sinful, offensive to the senses or sensibilities, repulsive, disgusting, cheap, worthless, degrading, lowly, of poor quality, very inferior. Now, this phrase, vile passions, comes from a Greek phrase which means passions of dishonor. Now, a second description that God gives to homosexuality in this text is shameful. In the second half of Romans 1.27, God said, men with men committing that which is shameful. The King James says, unseemly. What does this word mean in the original? Persbacher's Greek lexicon says it means indecency, infamous lust, or lewdness. But then, pertinent to our present question is the next phrase. He says, unnatural. Now friends, I want to be tactful, but I want you to consider the anatomy of a man and a woman. There, there's a natural complement that is there. God made them that way. But you see, he makes a contrast here, and he says when a man has sexual relations with another man, he says it's not the same as sinful sex between a man and a woman. He says it is vile. He says it is passion that is dishonorable. It is unnatural. Jude in verse 7 describes it as pursuing, quote, strange flesh. The word strange in the King James Version of the Bible means foreign and unauthorized. You know, if you consider someone who views pornography, maybe it begins with what they would refer to as soft core pornography. But over time, his appetite grows and it morphs and it becomes more perverted. And, and there's a tendency with these things to get more perverted and, and corrupt. You see, adultery is sinful, but homosexuality, it's on down the line. It, it has progressed to something more corrupt and twisted and, and perverted. In fact, I, I would put it this way. Heterosexual adultery is sinful, but it's natural. It, it's sinful, but natural. Homosexuality is sinful, and it is more perverted activity. It is unnatural. The Bible calls it vile, passions of dishonor, unnatural and, and strange flesh is the terminology used. And, and I would add this, homosexuality is also worse in its effects. You know, a man who views pornography, maybe in the privacy of, of his home, he is guilty of, of sexual sin. But you know, the scope might be limited to him and his household. Now, a man who commits adultery, well, he affects his wife and his family, and, and certainly he has carried this to a higher level. 
But you see, homosexuality affects our children and it affects our nation. And this ruling by the Supreme Court is an attack on the home as God designed it. That is, a man and a woman. You see, the home is, is the basic element. It, it is the building block of society. But homosexuality throws aside God's definition and it substitutes perversion in its place. Number four, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. That's what some people are saying. They are saying that the Bible doesn't actually condemn that, but, but rather we've been misinterpreting it. And so I've already had some people say to me that they've been talking to friends about homosexuality and maybe they will cite a verse in the Bible that condemns homosexuality and the person will respond with a completely different interpretation, leaving the Christian rather stunned and, and not really knowing how to respond. Now, just on the surface, doesn't this concept bother you that, that suddenly people have discovered a completely new meaning to, to what virtually all Bible scholars have understood? Let, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. In Genesis chapters 18 and 19, we have the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now frequently Christians have pointed to this account as proof that homosexuality is sinful. And we reference the fact that God destroyed these cities due to that sin. But some people today are saying that we have been misusing this. First, they will argue that it was not homosexuality that brought about the destruction of these cities. Rather, it was pride. It was inhospitality. And they'll take their argument from Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49. Now let's consider this passage together. Ezekiel 16, 49. It says this, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride and fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And so they'll say, look, see what the Bible says? The Bible says that the sins of Sodom were pride and the fact that she was rich and, and lazy and she did not help the poor. Friends, let's go back and read Genesis chapter 19 and we'll make some observations about this. Genesis 19 beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. Now, I would stop there and ask, why did he insist strongly? Was it because the people were so proud and, you know, Lot didn't want them to be exposed to that type of pride? No, that, that doesn't make good sense. Keep reading. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down... The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and they said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Now friends, the word know here is a reference to sexual relations. You see, it's clear what the problem was in Sodom. They said, we want to have sexual relations with them. It is clear that Lot knew what the problem was in Sodom. Now somebody says, but what about Ezekiel 16, 49? How do you explain that? Let's go back to Ezekiel and keep reading. Listen to Ezekiel 16, 50. It begins, and he tells us there's more to what we just read in verse 49, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit." Friends, what is he telling us in these two verses? He is telling us that the people of Sodom were prideful and they were arrogant and they were wealthy and they had abundance, they wouldn't help the poor, and they committed abomination. Friends, when a city or a country becomes immersed in homosexuality, I'm telling you that there are a lot of other things that have preceded it. You see, there's a progression of sin. They had all these other problems and they committed abomination. Listen to what the book of Jude tells us 
about Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude in verse 7 says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You see, the Lord says they were destroyed because they went after strange flesh and suffered the consequences of that. Well, some people very desperately will say that what is actually being condemned in Genesis 18 and 19 is not homosexuality, but rather it is rape. That is, the men of Sodom were trying to rape these other men. And they will say rape is condemned in the Bible, but not committed homosexual marriage. They'll, they'll say that's not condemned. Well, what about that? Let's go over and consider a passage from the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. Listen to this. The Lord speaks very plainly here. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman. You see, he's describing this very clearly. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. The Lord goes out of His way to make this very plain, very clear. If a man has sexual relations with a man in the way that he would with a woman, they have both committed abomination. Now, there's our word abomination again. It's the same word from Ezekiel 16 and verse 49 speaking about why God destroyed Sodom. But you see, this is not rape that's being talked about in this passage. This is a sin in which both parties are guilty participants. Now, I could go on with other examples, but friends, the principle is the same. The Bible condemns homosexuality. Now, there are people out there who are twisting the Scriptures to, to try to make it say something that it really does not. And the fact is, we just need to know how to answer them. Number five. A fifth thing that people are saying is this, judge not. Have you heard anybody say that in relation to this homosexual question recently? Friends, this is an absolute misuse of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says in that passage, judge not that you be not judged. Now, how do you answer this when someone says the Bible says don't judge and, and you are judging when you condemn homosexuality? Well, first, I would point them to John chapter 7 and verse 24 where the Bible says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The Bible says we are to make judgments, but we have to make the right type of judgments. Secondly, I would point out to the person making this accusation that in Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 through 19, the, the judging chapter that they have referenced, that passage actually commands judging. It says that we are to look at people's fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. We are to make a judgment based upon their actions, upon their fruit. You see, the Bible forbids judging without all of the facts. The Bible forbids jumping to conclusions. The, the Bible forbids hypocritical judgments. But the Bible never forbids calling sin, sin. In fact, we're required to do that. Okay, number six. A sixth thing that some people are saying is that God made them that way. They were born that way. How can we condemn homosexuals when God made them homosexuals? Friends, first, it is not true that God made them as homosexuals. God did not make them that way. Homosexuality is a learned behavior. Now, we could spend a lot of time on this, but for now, I just want to mention two passages of Scripture. The first one is Genesis 18 and verse 25. Now this goes back to when God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham is pleading with God about this. And, you know, if I can find uh, this number of righteous men in the city, will you spare it? And this is what Abraham says to God. He says, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked, Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Friends, what's the point of this? The point is, God is going to do right. God always does right. Now, I want you to consider with me the problem we have. If God made the people of Sodom homosexuals, that is, He made them, He created them as homosexuals, and then He destroyed them because of it. 
Do you see the problem with that? In Leviticus chapter 20, homosexual practices had the death penalty offense. God created them that way, and then He required that they be killed because of it? Do you see the problem with this? It's a contradiction of the nature of God Himself. Here's a second passage, James chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. Friends, homosexuality is evil. God does not instill that in man. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does God tempt any man. Now, in this study, we're not dealing with the scientific aspect of this, but let me very quickly say, there is no science to support the idea of being born gay. There is no gay gene. Okay, number seven. A seventh thing that some people are saying is that Jesus never addressed homosexuality. If this is such a serious thing, if this is really a sin, why did Jesus not address it? Friends, this is what Jesus said. Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Matthew 19 and verse four. You see, Jesus did not specifically mention homosexuality, but he specifically defined marriage as being between a male and a female. Now listen to me, sex outside of marriage is sinful and sex inside of a marriage must be between a male and a female. Let me repeat that. Sex outside of marriage is sinful and inside of marriage it must be a male and a female. Now you could take those facts and you could put them in a logical syllogism and easily prove that Jesus forbade homosexual marriage. And you know, besides all of that, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof, correction and instruction and in righteousness. You see, the other passages in the Bible that forbid homosexuality are just as much from Jesus as Matthew 19 is. Okay, number eight. Some people are saying that homosexual marriage is a civil right that is equal to racial equality. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think this is absurd, but, but I want to mention it because I have heard this said a lot in recent times. It is suggested that homosexual rights are equivalent to racial rights or racial equality. Friends, the problem is that homosexuality is a choice. It is a sin. You know, a person's race or his nationality or his skin color is it's not a matter of choice, nor is it a matter of right and wrong. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 says that God has made of one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 says that God does not look on the outward appearance, but on the heart. What's the point? The point is God doesn't care what your skin looks like but he does care whether you obey him. Okay, number nine. Sometimes people today are saying this, it's not hurting you, why don't you just mind your own business? It is said by defenders of homosexual marriage, it's not hurting you, just mind your own business. But friends, the fact is, it is hurting me. It is hurting us. It's hurting the entire country. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Homosexual marriage is an attack on the very foundation of this country, and that is the home. And so to say that it's not hurting anyone is simply contrary to the facts. You know, while it's true that more sex crimes are committed by heterosexuals than by homosexuals, the reason is that there are far more heterosexuals. But if you look at sex crime statistics, proportionately speaking, the number of sex crimes committed by homosexuals is far, far higher than that of heterosexuals. All right, with all of these things considered, I want us to think about this. What is our responsibility in this matter? Where do we go from here? You know, the Supreme Court has said that this is now the law of the land 
and that gay marriage is now to be accepted in every state in the country. What are we to do? Number one, we cannot compromise. Christians cannot compromise. You know, we could sit back and think, well, you know, if we buck it or uh, if we oppose it, we're going to be persecuted. If we speak against it, we'll likely be ridiculed. We might lose our tax-exempt status. I might lose my job. And, and so I'm just going to sit back and accept it and go along and not say anything. Friends, we can't ever do that. Now more than ever, we have to have courage. We have to have backbone. We need preachers who are not afraid to speak where the Bible speaks on this subject. You know, it makes me think about Revelation chapter 2. The church at that point in history, at that point in time, was being persecuted. And it was a real possibility that as a Christian during that time, you might be beaten. You might be imprisoned. You might even be killed for faithfulness to Jesus Christ. But you know, it's in that context that John wrote Revelation 2 and verse 10. He said, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and that you have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you a crown of life. You see, the Lord said you may go to prison. You may endure persecution. It may cost you your very life. But be faithful and there is a crown of life awaiting you. Number two, how do we deal with this? Number two, we need to reach out to homosexuals with the gospel. Friends, you know the church is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And homosexuals are sinners. And they need to be invited. They need to be welcome to come and to hear the truth. But you know, it could be that we find homosexuality repugnant to the point that we won't even invite such a person to the services. Well, shame on us. Shame on you and shame on me if we so class the sin of homosexuality that somehow we think they're not good enough for the truth. Friends, let me tell you something. You weren't good enough for the truth, and yet someone shared it with you. I was not good enough for the truth, but thanks be to God that someone saw fit to teach me the gospel anyway. You know, sometimes when we talk about this particular subject, people will say, well, you are haters. You know, that's kind of the buzzword right now. When you discuss this and you oppose homosexuality, they say you hate them. Friends, if that's the case, if a person is expressing this out of hate, they need to repent because that is not a biblical teaching. But you see, simply saying that this is wrong and sinful and they need to change, this isn't about hate. This is about love. This is about the desire for a person to change and become what God wants them to be so that they can go to heaven eternally. How do we handle this? Number one, we have to stand strong. Number two, we need to reach out to homosexuals with the gospel. Number three, we need to teach and we need to understand that homosexuals can change. You know, just as homosexuality is a learned behavior, they can learn better behavior. Listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. This is from the ESV. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, I'm going to stop right there because there is a footnote by this word homosexuality in the ESV. This is what it says. It says, the two Greek terms translated by this phrase refer to the passive and active partners in consensual homosexual acts. Now the King James Version translates these two Greek terms as effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. What is that talking about? It's talking about the individual who plays the role of the woman and the individual who plays the role of the man. And then it goes on to say this. It says that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to verse 11. This is the key phrase we're looking for. Verse 11 says, And such were some of you. And such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Friends, what's the point of this? The point is 
homosexuals can change. He says some of the people in Corinth used to practice homosexuality, but they had ceased that sin and they had become Christians and they had been washed by the blood of Jesus. Friends, if I were going to summarize this discussion, I would say this. Number one, we serve a judge who is infinitely greater than the Supreme Court of the United States. Number two, my resolve must be infinitely greater than that of the world around me. And number three, the blood of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than any sin. Friends, God loves homosexuals just like He loves every other soul that is made in His image. They can cease this sin and they can be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's the job of Christians to carry that message.